So we're working on uh, this problem, rainy and nice, and we want to know what is the probability it's rainy in three days from now. And we know that there's this matrix that helps you with that. So there's this transition probability matrix. The transition matrix. And that tells you uh, how things evolve. And it's going to be a two by two matrix because we have two states. So the two states are uh, either rainy or nice. And so it's going to be a two by two matrix. Uh, rainy and ice are just letters. You can put them in any order you want. So your matrix might be different than my matrix if you switch the order. But let's make a two by two matrix like this, where we'll make it like this with rainy first and nice second, rainy and nice. And the rule in the transition matrix is you put in the probability to go from the row to the column. I don't know how to write it. From row to column. So over here, this is the probability to go from rainy to rainy. Over here is the probability to go from rainy to not rainy uh, there. And so we can read those off from the question. And I believe in the question, let's see, let's go read what it says. In the question, it says, if it's rainy, then it's rainy tomorrow with probability 2 fifth. So there's a 2 over 5 here. And that means the other one is what's the probability it's nice if it was raining today, that's 3 fifths. And similarly, for the other row, you have if it's nice today, then it's rainy tomorrow with probability 1 fifth. So this one will be 1 fifth. And by default, this must be 4 fifths. And you can always check uh, in a transition matrix the rows sum to 1. Rows sum to 1. Um, so that's another way to check and make sure things are, are going right. So this is the one I got. Um, maybe you got something similar. So it's possible you, if you switch the order of R and N, you got the same matrix but flipped. Uh, that would also be correct. And the question is, how do you use this to find the answer to the question? And I'll give you one more hint, which is you can, you can factor out the 1 fifth, like we did before, to get a nice matrix with numbers, 2, 3, 1, 4. And then you can turn this into a calculation that involves the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4 uh, added up in the right ways. OK, let me give a couple more minutes. Any questions or comments about the transition matrix? Who had that transition matrix already? OK, great. So some people had that already. Maybe I didn't give enough time uh, for other people. But let me give you a couple more minutes to try and figure out what is the answer to the question using the transition matrix. Uh, OK, we're up to 13 people. So I guess most men, some people have already put an answer. Let me give like two more minutes. <coughs> Okay, so like 30 seconds left to put in your, your guess, what you think it is.
Okay. Let's see what people said. If I can find the mouse. Where's the mouse? Okay. Uh, so let me reveal what people said. People said, what numbers did they say? 8, 13, 25, 27, 28. 32 was very popular. Nine people chose 32. Uh, the correct answer is 32. So 50% of people got it right. It's possible if you have a number close to 32, you just made an arithmetic mistake. Let's go over uh, how you would get it. Uh, so this is the transition matrix, which we called M last time. Some people call it T uh, or T. Some people call it P for probability and what it does is it tells you how to go from the probabilities in, at one time to the probabilities at the next time by matrix multiplication. So, for example, if you want to know the probability vector for day one, so this is the day one probability row vector, so this is the probability that S1 equals R and the probability that S1 equals nice. So that's a vector of probabilities. Again, this is a vector that sums to one. All the entries are probabilities, and R and N are the only possibilities. So on uh, day one, it's got to be one of these things. The probabilities are going to sum to one. The rule we discovered last time is that this is equal to the probability on day zero times the matrix M multiplied like that. So you do this row matrix multiplication, and that tells you um, what it is. And in our case, this is going to be something quite nice. One, zero. That's because P0 is the probability on day zero. The probability S0 equals R, probability S0 equals N, and that is 1, 0. Okay, so on uh, day 0, we're definitely raining and rainy and definitely not rainy, because that was given in the problem. And we multiply this by our transition matrix, which is this 2, 3, 1, 4 matrix. 2, 3, 1, 4. Okay. So now you got to do the matrix multiplication. Uh, you could do it immediately. Let's just do it, I guess. One nice thing to know about matrix multiplication is if you have simple things like this, it's kind of easier to think about it in terms of linear combinations of either rows or columns. And if you're multiplying on the left, this is saying do one copy of the first row and zero copies of the second row. That's what it's saying. So we're going to have two, three. That's one copy of the first row. That's all we're going to have. Uh, so it's going to be one fifth times two, three. Not too complicated. All right, day two, day two. Uh, and you can get this by doing P2, which is going to be P1. And then you're going to multiply by M again. So this is going to be 1 fifth times 2, 3. That's what we got before. And we're going to multiply by the matrix 2, 3, 1, 4. Oh, don't forget, there should be an extra 1 fifth in there. So altogether, it's going to be a 1 over 25. And now we're going to do 2, 3 times 2, 3, 1, 4. Uh, and this is where you can do a row by column and memorize something. You can also think of two copies of the first row. That would, two copies of the first row would be like 4, 6, plus three copies of the next row, um, which would be like 3, 12. So it's going to be uh, 4, 6, plus 3, 12. That's how I would do it. OK. Uh, you could also check the other way. Um, I guess the other way people do it is they go row by column. So they do, okay, let, me, let me get the laser out. Okay, 2, 3 by 2, 1. And they say, like, you do this row by this column, 2 times 2 plus 3 times 1, that's 4, 3. Uh, however you do it, you will get the, the right answer. Okay, so you get 1 over 25. 4 plus 3 is 7. 6 plus 12 is 18. And, and there you go. And last but not least, on day 3, what I asked you for, you need to figure out P3. So it's going to be 1 over 25 times 7, 18 times 1 fifth, 2, 3, 1, 4. And again, you're going to get two copies. Uh, seven copies of the first row is going to be 14 uh, and 21. And then you're going to get 18 copies of the next row, 14 plus 18. And 4 times 18, that is a big number. Is that what I want? Yeah, 4 times 18. I guess that's a, a little bit less than 80. It's like a... 72? Okay. All right. And it's all times 1 <coughs> over 125. Okay. Uh, and we can scroll down a bit. 14 plus 18 is where this number 
32 comes from. That is the answer. And I guess the other one is 93. And if we did it correctly, it should add up to 1, right? So 32 plus 93 is 125. The 125 in front, it adds up to 1. OK, so there we go. We found the day three probabilities starting from a rainy day. Any questions or comments about that one? Uh, there's a very slightly different way you can do it that ends up being the same thing. So here, I was repeatedly updating the p's. But you could also stack the equations together and notice that p3 is actually p0 times m cubed. So this is an alternative, alternative solution. And that really is not very surprising. If we're multiplying by m every time, and we multiply by m three times, that's what cubing a matrix means. So uh, you could have done m cubed. Um, and if you do m cubed, then instead of doing rows and matrices every time, you are doing three matrix multiplications. So I can just give you a nice explicit formula. So p3 is going to be uh, 1, 0. And then I'm going to have 2, 3, 1, 4, 2, 3, 1, 4. 2, 3, 1, 4, just written out three times. Okay, and I factored out all the 1 out of 5s to put a 1 out of 125 in front, a 1 out of 5 cubed. So instead of kind of doing it one at a time, you could have multiplied these matrices together to get it. You would have gotten the same thing. I can even tell you what this matrix multiplication is going to be because we already calculated it. It's going to be 32, 93 in the first row. And in the second row, you would have to do the calculation uh, again and do a whole bunch of more matrix multiplications you get some other answer. So 3293 is the top, and uh, the other row is a mystery. Let me, to make this equation actually make sense, let me, uh, let me write it like this. So 1 over 125, and then we do 1, 0 times this. OK. Uh, did anybody do it this way? Yeah. It's 3194. 3194, great. So 3194. I believe that is correct. Uh, and what this is saying, the 3194 says, if it was a rainy day, it's 32 out of 125. But if it was a sunny day today, then it would be a 31 out of 125 for it to be rainy. And you might notice these are not very different. So whether or not it's rainy or sunny kind of doesn't affect what's going to happen three days from now very much, right? Three days from now, things have kind of got all mixed together. And the chance that it's rainy or sunny has come down to this very similar number. So we're going to explore this a little bit today, uh, this idea of kind of like approaching something where these things are constant. Um, OK, yeah, this is a good place before we start with new things. Everything so far, I think, has been just a review of how this matrix works and where it comes from. Uh, and it can seem kind of mysterious. So I tried to show with the snakes and ladders like where this matrix comes from sort of naturally. Uh, sometimes when you need to calculate, you just memorize the rules and you do it. Um, but it is a good one to try to understand what's going on. Any questions or comments? Yeah. Just wondering, the matrix multiplication, mm -hmm. is there a reason why you use a, a row vector first, and then you multiply by the Markov chain? Yeah, why did I do row vectors for p instead of column vectors? Yes. I mean the yes. This is a fantastic question. And it really just comes down to what should go in the matrix. So if inside the matrix you put in this rule from row to column. So over here in the top entry, we put in, we're going from R and we're going to N. If that's how you make your matrix, then the correct way to get things to calculate what you want is to do row multiplication. You could do make another matrix where in you do from the column to the row, right? And that would be the transpose of this matrix. So you could equally well, like in a universe where we go to Mars and there's aliens on Mars who've done Markov chains. They might have done it that way. And if they do it from the column to the row, then it would all be column matrix, uh, multiplication. But because we chose to make the matrix this way, you got to put the, the things in row vectors. So it's like a convention that somebody decided a long time ago. Uh, so in, in our universe, the transition matrices, the rows always sum to 1. Sometimes these are called stochastic matrices, by the way. And this is just like a convention. What is the definition of a stochastic matrix? It's a matrix where the rows sum to 1 on Mars, maybe the columns sum to 1 instead. And they have a whole theory that's exactly the same as our theory, but flipped. But we make the rows sum to 1. And when you make the rows sum to 1, you've got to do uh, multiplication on the left for the probabilities. We're going to see today that multiplication by a column vector actually does mean something. Um, and that means something other than the probabilities. And we'll, we'll get to that 
uh, later. So yeah, this is a great question, and it's just you know a convention of the universe. I know that mostly when you take linear algebra class, you do uh, column vectors, and I don't know whoever the probability people are decided we got to do row vectors, and we're stuck with it. Great question. Any any other questions or comments? Okay, so let's see how this thing works. Or I'm going to investigate this idea of of kind of approaching some specific thing, and uh, to show you to kind of like visualize what this looks like. I did the problem. I, sh I did it by hand here so you could see all the gory details. But of course, we can also do it on the computer and see what's going on. Um, so this is a little Python program that calculates the probabilities. So uh, let's go through the Python program. It's not very complicated, very similar to what we did before. Uh, import NumPy. I also imported a package to plot things. So we can plot things uh, later and make some nice pictures. Uh, then I made the matrix M, which is exactly the matrix we had before. Uh, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.2, 0 0.8, uh, which is two fifths, three fifths, one fifth, uh, four fifths. I guess maybe, okay, probably, first of all, I probably have to run everything again because the computer went to sleep. Um, but we can also, why don't we ask it to output M so we can make sure that it is doing what we think it's doing. That's always a good check. So there we go. Um, and here I did M cubed. So I did M at M at M, that is multiplying M three times to get M cubed. Uh, if you multiply that by 125, you get exactly 3293, 3194. Like we said, um, the 125 is canceling out the 1 over 125. And over here, I did the little loop that we just did. I started with v0, which is the vector 1, 0, probability of rainy 100%, probability of nice 0%. And I stacked up the vectors in a little list. And so what I did is I did a matrix multiplication of v0, and then I used this command to do the powers. So I did m to the power 1, m to the power 2, m to the power 3. Um, and I did v is v0, what you started with, times m to the power n. And that gives you the probabilities on the nth day. And I did this all the way for the first eight days. And I stacked them all into this list. And then I told the computer, please make a nice little plot. And so here's the computer doing the, the, the work. On the first day, 100%, or the zeroth day, rather, 100% 0, then 40, 60, then 2872, 0 0.256, 0 0.744. These are all, again, if you multiply by the right power of five, these will become nice integers. But as numbers, you can kind of see what they're doing. 0 0.256, 0 0.2512, 0 0.25024, 0 0.250048, 0 0.250096. Uh, this number really wants to be, uh, uh, it's getting closer and closer to 0 0.25. And you can see what's happening in a little plot over here. So let me zoom out so we can see the whole thing. So on the bottom here is the days. I should have labeled it, but I guess I got lazy. Um, so on the bottom is the days, and on the, the y-axis is the probability. And every day I have plotted both the nice probability and the rainy probability. Of course, they sum to 1. So if you know one of them, you know the other one. And you can see that the rainy probability started up here, but it's, getting, it's kind of going and getting not changing much once you reach these outer days. It's zooming down to this line. OK. Uh, any questions or comments about what's being shown here? OK. So that is all started from a rainy day. What I want to see is what would happen if you started from a sunny day instead. And so to do that, I'm going to actually have to run everything. So uh, let's run it one more time and make sure it's working. So here we go. Nice plot. It works. If you run it from uh, a different starting position, let's start with uh, a nice day. So this is 0, 1 starting from a nice day instead. And let's see how it looks differently. So in this one, right, the beginning is different, but by the end, it looks very similar. The rainy day probability is very close to 25%, and the nice day probability is close to 75%. And you can start with, let's start with something else. Let's start with 50-50. Uh, Maybe there's a day where it's a 50-50 chance of rain. The weatherman says 50% chance of rain. That would be something like this. Oh, look. Over here, the computer plotted both dots on top of each other, so we can only see one. Um, but we can see that, again, it's just whatever you start with, it kind of smooshes out, and the, the rainy day probabilities go towards 25%, and the sunny days go towards 75%. And this will kind of happen no matter what you start with. I don't know. What's another number I can start with? 2080. Here's another one. I guess 2080 is kind of boring, because it's kind of similar to what it, what it ends up at. And when you look at the probabilities, they're always getting really close to 25%. 75. Yeah. Is this a condition, the, the, um, 
the stabilization, is that a condition for all Markov chains, or is there examples where it, it's a little bit more chaotic? Uh, yeah, this is what we're going to investigate. Okay. Uh, and it's true, it, it, it can never really be chaotic. Mm -hmm. It can kind of do like corner case things. So it will either do this or like a mixture of this or like something where you would go, oh, well, that's silly. Um, and we're going to see an example of that as well. But, and actually, the thing that I wanted to show you, and the reason I did a two by two matrix, is the reason it does this is not some like deep, mysterious reason. It's a very simple reason that, again, sorry for those of you who didn't have a good linear algebra class. If you had a good linear algebra class, you will immediately understand why. It's a very simple property about matrices that we're going to calculate right now, and we're going to see why does this happen. And there's some like simple fact about matrices that forces this to happen in a way that is perfectly understandable. And the way I'm going to show you this is I'm going to ask the following question. Here I'm doing powers of the matrix. So I'm doing m, m squared, m cubed, m4. And of course, you can brute force and calculate it, right? You could do, you could just multiply them all out, do a lot of multiplications, do, 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 sit there all day multiplying. But my question for you is, is there a smarter way to do a bunch of matrix multiplications? So if someone comes to you and says, please do 100 matrix multiplications, is there some kind of way you can skip the work of doing these? And so I'm going to ask that to you guys in a Mathematize. Feel free to chat with your neighbors and kind of like brainstorm what would be the sneaky, smart ways to compute the matrix power m to the m efficiently. So it's a true or false. The most efficient way to calculate a matrix power m to the n is to do n matrix multiplications. So m, m squared, m cubed, multiplying by m every time. Every time you do a matrix multiplication, you've got to do a row by column. Can you think of a smarter way? OK, I'll give you two minutes to say, think about that. Okay, there's like two seconds left. Let's see what people said. Uh, maybe I made it too obvious. Let's, let's find out. Uh, all right, 17 people said false. Yes, that is, that is the correct answer. Uh, reveal correct answer. It is false. There are many sneaky tricks you can do that will speed this up quite a lot. Does anybody know what to suggest a sneaky trick? So I wrote down the obvious way to do it, which is to multiply n times. Do m, m squared, m cubed. And you have to do n multiplications. So you get all the way up to m to the n. That's why I said there's n operations. And each thing is a matrix uh, multiplication. So that's like d squared operations. Um, each row and column you got to do is like doing d operations. And you got to do that a bunch of times. I guess it's like d cubed. Maybe it's like d cubed. OK, I think it's like d cubed now. So uh, I, I believe there's also a tricky way you can do matrix multiplication where you reduce it from d cubed to like d to the 2.5 or something. But uh, let's not talk about that. OK, so uh, so you got to do n operations. If it's a big matrix, that's going to take you even longer because 
doing doing one matrix multiplication is a lot. But is there a faster way? Anybody got a suggestion? Yeah. So you can diagonalize the matrix in the form P, D, and P inverse. And then this is fantastic. So this is the one. This is the one we're gonna use the diagonalization. Diagonalization. Uh, and in diagonalization, what you do is you do a whole bunch of work to write the matrix M in a nice way. And I'm going to write it to start. I'm just going to say M is similar. So M is similar to, similar to, that means something in linear algebra, a diagonal matrix. And when you multiply diagonal matrices, they're very easy to multiply because the, only the diagonals talk to each other. And then once you have the diagonal matrix, you can just take all the entries to the power N in the diagonal matrix. Uh, so D to the N is easy. And so this will save us a lot of work. So you gotta do a lot of work up front to get M is similar to some diagonal matrix D, diagonal matrix. And then you will save work because doing the powers of D is easier. Uh, so this is the one we're gonna use and we're gonna go into in detail. There's actually in between multiplying N times and diagonalizing, there is one other trick that is often quite useful. So in this case, it turns out diagonalization is nice, but there's a way you can simplify quite a lot. Uh, and it's a really good trick to know because it works not just for matrices, but like any anything you're going to multiply n times, you should not multiply n times. There's a, a smart way to do it. And I'll tell you what the answer is. You can multiply log n times instead. Multiply, let's say, log base 2 of n times. So this is a good trick to know. Anyone know how could you, instead of multiplying n times, you could just do log n times. It's like a strictly better version of, of this one. Is a, a, a similar thing that happens with food, yeah. It's a shot in the dark, yeah. but could you kind of divide and conquer so you, you, you do two at a time or something? And then yes, that's exactly the right idea, yeah. So but how would that reduce us to log two n? So the hint I was going to give, if you have eight children, which is I guess a lot of children these days, but if you have eight children and you go to cut a cake for the eight children or like a sandwich or something, you don't have to do eight cuts. You can get away with just three cuts. Right? You can, instead of doing 8, when n equals 8, you can do log base 2 of 8, which is 3. So how would you cut a cake for kids using only three knife cuts? Yeah? Well, you, if you have, let's say you have eight multiplications, you split yeah. in the middle until 4 and 4. Yes. You split in the middle 2 and 2, and if the 2 and 2 you multiply, you <coughs> That's right. And you square that. That's right. Exactly. So, and this is exactly what you said. It's kind of a divide and conquer. When you're doing the multiply n times, every time you make the power go up by 1. But you could take what you have so far and do all of that. So instead of doing m, m squared, m cubed, and multiplying by n every time, you could multiply by what you have so far. So you could kind of, kind of do m, m squared, and this is the idea. Don't do m squared times m to get m cubed now. Do m squared times m squared, and then you get m to the 4, right? right? And then do m to the 4 times m to the 4 to get m to the 8. And then do m to the 8 times m to the 8 to get m to the 16, and so on. All the way up to, eventually, okay, you have to do some shenanigans with like the binary representation of n to like make this work at the last step. But at the end, you're going to get m to the n. And instead of going up by 1 every time, you doubled every time. So it kind of takes you log n, log 2n operations instead of n. This is a really good trick to know. It's really useful for all sorts of things. Uh, this is, in particular, this is used for uh, cryptography. In cryptography, you often have to calculate things like a to the power e mod p. And you don't actually. E is some horrible number with like a thousand digits. And you don't want to do this in order E time. You want to do it in order log two of E time. Anyway, um, so it's a good trick to know. Uh, and it will save you a lot of work. And in some situations, this will be the fastest. Um, but the one we're going to talk about today is diagonalization, which has a lot of upfront work and like knowing about how linear algebra works. But once you do all the upfront work, then you don't have to do any of this multiplying because you just have a diagonal matrix where it's like obvious what the thing to the power n is. OK, so I'm going to get into some, some diagonalization stuff. But this is before we start to get down the rabbit hole of diagonalization. Any questions or comments about any of this stuff? OK, so let's do it. So I said m is similar to d. And you have to remember what similar means. Uh, and one way is the formula way. So m equals, uh, it's going to be, I want, let's write it as lambda. Actually, lambda is sometimes the diagonal one. Let's call it uh, u. u d u inverse. That's what similar means. So it means 
there is some invertible matrix U where M equals U D U inverse. And the nice thing about these two things, if it's true that M equals U D U inverse, you can very easily calculate M to the N. So for example, M squared will be U D U inverse times U D U inverse. And now you have a nice miracle that happens in the middle, which is that the U inverse and the U are right next to each other. They cancel out U inverse times U is the identity. And you're left with U D squared U inverse. So if you can write M equals U D U inverse, then the powers of M are also like the powers of D. If you have two similar matrices, their powers are also similar matrices by the same U. And this works in general. So M to the N is U D to the N. U inverse, uh, that's our ideal. OK, what is the matrix U in this case? So if we want D to be diagonal, the matrix U is going to be the matrix matrix of eigenvectors, eigenvectors. So we're going to find the eigenvectors of M. And we're going to stack them on top of each other to make the matrix U. And then we're going to calculate U inverse, uh, and that will be the answer. So I. I could do, we could spend you know, a full class sort of doing all the arithmetic of how you find the eigenvectors and stuff. But I will just tell you what they are. And uh, at the end of the day, we want the uh, left eigenvectors of u. So I guess you had a choice. Okay, this is, this is like a part of linear algebra that you might not have seen, is that there are left eigenvectors and right eigenvectors. Left eigenvectors are of this form. v times m equals v. This is a left eigenvector. Uh, and I'm missing the lambda. Let's, let's do this in, in blue. Left eigenvector. It's called left because it's multiplying on the left. So this is lambda times v. So when you multiply by the vector v, you get a scaled copy back. That is the left multiplication. Let me move this over a bit so that I'm not missing some of the thing. Okay. Um, there's also right eigenvectors. And a right eigenvector is probably what you saw in linear algebra class. M B equals lambda B. Lambda B. Let's do it like that. Um, and here's the thing. You can do this calculation to find M to the N. You can do this either way. But I chose to do the left eigenvectors because the left eigenvectors are meaningful in our problem. They have something that they actually represent some interesting probabilities that come up. And that is because the probabilities evolve by left <coughs> multiplication. So this is a choice that I made, is to do the left eigenvectors. And they're more meaningful for our problem. Um, so even though in linear algebra class you saw the right eigenvectors, it's, it's going to be the exact same calculation. So we're not going to do these ones today. Uh, and I guess the other thing to know is they're different. So if you know the left eigenvectors, it doesn't tell you anything about the right eigenvectors. Uh, there is actually there is one nice connection in eigenland. And it's not that the eigenvectors are the same. Does anyone know what the connection between the left and the rights are? Yeah. Eigenvalues? The eigenvalues are the same. So even though the eigenvectors are completely different, have like nothing to do with each other, there's like this weird miracle that they have the same eigenvalues. And I guess one way to say it is u and v, the d has to be the same either way. So they have the same same lambda, but different, uh, different uh, otherwise. So same lambda, but different v. OK. Um, so just watch out for that, because a lot of, if you go to like a computer program and you say, please give me the eigenvectors, they will often assume you mean the right eigenvectors. Um, so if you just take M and you put it and say like NP dot uh, do the eigenvectors, it'll give you the right eigenvectors. Um, and we want the left ones. One way to get around that is you just put in like M transpose. If you transpose the M, it'll turn all the lefts into rights. Um, so, okay, just watch out for that. Okay, we did the left ones, and I'll tell you what they are. One of them is... 1, 3 times m, that equals 1, 3. 1, 3. So the vector 1, 3. Uh, this is a nice equation. Have we seen 1, 3? Like, you could just think, OK, we're just doing like algebra now. 1, 3. It's got just some numbers. has nothing to do with anything. But actually, I claim 1, 3 has appeared already in the class today. Where, has one, where have we seen 1, 3? Think about trying to interpret 1, 3 as a probability vector. Yeah. It's like a, the convergence of our system was 
one quarter and then three quarters? Yes, that's right. So we saw before that we sort of had this 25%, 75% thing going on. And if you took the vector 1, 3, which is written to make each entry nice, and you made it so that it's summed to 1, right? 1, 3 sums to 4, that's not a probability vector, that's just some vector. But if you made it a probability vector by dividing it by the sum of the entries, then what would this equation say? It would say that uh, 1 quarter, 3 quarters times m is equal to 1 quarter, 3 quarters. <clears throat> OK. So this 1 quarter, 3 quarters, even though 1, 3 looks like you know, just algebra stuff, 1 quarters, 3 quarters is very clearly saying something about the probabilities. And it's not a coincidence that 1 quarters, 3 quarters is the kind of like what the rainy nice was converging to um, before. And in fact, if you interpret this equation as a probability, what does it say? This says, as a sentence, this would say something like, if p for some day was 1 quarter, 3 quarters. So if today I go on, I turn on the radio and they say, the chance of rain today is 25%, and the chance of nice today is 75%, so that's p0. Then this equation, what is it telling you? This equation is actually telling you what is going to be the chance of rain one day from now. Then p1 equals, uh, it's always p0 times m. And in this case, p0 times m for this special p0 is back to p0. It's still 1 quarter, 3 quarters, 1 3 quarters. So if on the radio today it's 1 quarter chance of rain and 3 quarters chance of not rain, then tomorrow it's still going to be 1 quarter chance of rain and 3 quarters chance of not rain. And the day after that will also be one quarter chance of rain and three quarters chance of rain. So if uh, that's the chance, then P1 is that. And actually, and actually, Pn is always going to be one quarter, three quarters, forever, forever. So sometimes people call this the steady state probability because they're saying if you get to that state, you just stay there forever, right? And state here doesn't mean either rainy or sunny. It means a chance of one quarter. Uh, chance of rain and three quarters chance of not rain. And steady state probability distribution is exactly related to the linear algebra property of the matrix, which is that it is an eigenvector of the matrix M of what eigenvalue? Of eigenvalue one. So because you get back exactly what you put in, that's the eigenvalue of one. So lambda equals one here. And the eigenvalues of eigen, the eigenvectors of eigenvalue one are exactly these steady state probability distribution vectors. OK, so that's one of them. Uh, so already, if you know this, uh, you can try to argue why this 1 quarter, 3 quarter thing is going to be important. Like, we see what, what's happening here. But I'll tell you the other eigenvector, and then it will become really obvious uh, what's going on. So the other eigenvector, let's do the other eigenvector. This is a 2 by 2 problem, so that's why it has two eigenvectors. The other eigenvector is. Uh, so there's only one other eigenvector. There's two total. Okay, the other one is this vector. It's the vector minus 1, 1 times m. Okay, and so 1, 3, we could convert it into a probability vector because all the entries were positive. We just divide by the total. It makes sense. Negative 1, 1, you can never convert to a probability vector because it sums to 0 and some of the entries are negative. So this one, you cannot interpret as some probability vector evolving. Um, but this, it turns out, is some simple thing, which is it's 1 fifth times negative 1, 1. So negative 1, 1, the component in negative 1, 1 gets shrunk by a factor of 1 fifth every time. OK, so if you have these two facts, which is the eigenvector of lambda equals 1 fifth and the eigenvector of lambda equals 1, um, you can put together a nice like mental story of what is happening as you have multiplied by the matrix M over and over again. And here's the story. So if you started at this exact p0, 1 quarters, 3 quarters, then nothing would happen to you. You stay there forever. In general, you start somewhere where it's not 1 quarters, 3 quarters. right? You start at the probability 50, 50 or something. But every single vector can be written as a linear combination of this special p0, 1 quarters, 3 quarters, plus some amount of this minus 1, 1 vector. So this is writing vectors in a different basis. So let's do uh, an example. Um, let's write the vector. Let, a good example is let's write the vector uh, 1, 0. Let's write this as a combination. It's going to be some amount of 1 quarters, 3 quarters. So some coefficient alpha over here plus uh, some coefficient beta times minus 1, 1. Uh, 
And let's figure out what those alphas and betas are, just to be really concrete. If you're in my other class, then sorry that I've, I've made you guys do uh, uh, linear combinations over and over again. Uh, let's, and this one I think you can do by just by staring at it. Let me, let me hopefully, uh, you can do it just by staring at it. All right, OK, let's write down the equation. So 1 equals alpha times a quarter minus beta minus beta. And 0 equals 3 quarters alpha plus beta. OK, so the second equation actually says that uh, minus beta equals 3 quarters alpha. And if minus, uh, minus beta equals 3 quarters alpha, then 1 equals alpha times a quarter plus 3 quarters alpha was alpha. So alpha is just 1. Alpha is just 1. Uh, alpha equals 1. And beta equals minus 3 quarters. OK, so great. So the equation is that. So the vector 1, 0 can be written as this. OK, so the vector 1, 0 can be written as a quarter, 3 quarters, minus some scalar 3 quarters times minus 1, 1. And now we're, when you apply the matrix M to this, so if somebody comes to apply the matrix M to this, so we started our day with 100% chance of rain, 0% chance of not rain, and we multiply by the matrix M, well, that's just multiplying by M. By the magic of linear operations, you can multiply each of these vectors by M. But these are the eigenvectors. They're not just any vectors. One quarter, three quarters in particular, just doesn't change. That's going to be exactly equal. So this thing will just go away. This, this multiplying by m just gets replaced with multiplying by 1 because it's an eigenvector. This one, because it's an eigenvector of eigenvalue 1 fifth, it gets shrunk, and then it stays there. So it gets shrunk. So this is after one day. After one day, you get a 1 fifth appearing here. Let's see what happens after two days. If you apply it after two days, then the whole thing is going to happen again. This thing is still the eigenvector of eigenvalue 1. You multiply by 1 once again. This one is the eigenvector of eigenvalue 1 fifth. You multiply by 1 fifth once again. OK? So after two days, you still have 1 quarters, 3 quarters. That's still strong. Nothing has changed there because multiplying by 1 doesn't do anything. But the other eigenvector, because the eigenvalue is a fifth, it's shrinking. It's going a fifth, 1 25th. On day 3, it'll be like this. And in fact, this is what I asked you guys to calculate. I asked you to calculate 1, 0, m cubed. And why was 1, 0, m cubed so close to the vector 1 quarter, 3 quarters? It's because you have 1 quarter, 3 quarters still standing there. And this other component has gotten shrunk down by so much. Um, it's 1 over 125. And then you only have this like little 3 quarters difference that's tacking on. So you're within, in terms of what I asked you guys to calculate, if you just added on 3 quarters, you would have gotten exactly 25%. I mean, that's how close you were, right? So the answer to the question this morning was 32. And a, an answer of 32 and 3 quarters is exactly 25%. So this is uh, after three days. After three days. And this is a pure 25%. And this is all if you divide by 125. OK. So hopefully you can see the pattern. As you add more and more days, as you go more and more, the eigenvector of eigenvalue 1 just stays strong forever, accumulating powers of 1, which don't do anything. And all the other eigenvalues, which are less than 1, they shrink away and melt away down to 0. So as you go more and more, and in fact, we can give an exact answer. I can, I can just tell you, without doing matrix multiplications, I can just tell you the exact answer of what is m to the n for any n. So here is, here is like the calculation we just did in secret, which is that if you want to know uh, 1, 0, of m to the n, I'll tell you exactly what it is. It's 1, 1 copy of 1 quarters, 3 quarters, minus 3 quarters, times 1 over 5 to the n, times minus 1, 1. And so what this is saying is that the probability that on day number n, so the state on day n, the probability that it's rainy, uh, given that it's rainy today, so this, given that it's rainy today, is exactly this vector, 1, 0. Asking for the probability that it's rainy is saying, give me the first component. Um, I can tell you a nice formula for this. It's 1 quarter, and then you do this minus with this minus, gives a plus, plus 3 quarters times 1 over 5 to the n. So that's an exact formula that tells you exactly what's going on. Uh, OK, is this exactly what I got before? Yes. OK, great. Um, and in fact, you can also, by this method, just compute what the matrix m to the n is. So m to the n. Um, and so if you do it. The way we did it, I think it's very intuitive. You can see what's going on. You can also plug and chug like algebra steps if you 
want to do these matrices with the U and the D, where are the U and the D? All the way up here. So you can calculate what U and D are. And so from that, you can calculate that M to the N is equal to this matrix, uh, one quarter, uh, one minus three, one, one. This whole thing, by the way, this is uh, one, three minus one, one inverse. So one, three minus one, one are the two eigenvectors stacked on, stack on top of each other. That's their inverse. So this is the U inverse. And then you multiply by one, zero, zero, one over five to the N. And then you multiply it by one, three minus one, one. So you can calculate the matrix M to the N exactly. And which after, if you do it uh, and you figure out what it is, uh, it will be some matrix. Okay, I'm just gonna leave it at that. Um, all right, so what is the moral of the story? These stochastic matrices, the transition matrices, very often they have exactly one eigenvector of eigenvalue one, and that eigenvalue stays strong. All the other eigenvalues are less than one, they're between zero and one, and they shrink away to zero as you apply the matrix more and more. As you wait further and further in time, this kind of information gets lost. Okay, and I have one, one extra thing to show you, which is I um, did it on the computer simulation to convince you that it's correct. So let's, let's go back to the computer simulation and do it. Uh, so here it is again, and here is the probabilities. We calculated those blue and orange dots before by doing powers of the matrix. And then I used the equation that I, I had before, this equation with the one over five to the n, uh, this equation, this equation. If you type in that equation and you plot it as a function of n, then it looks like that and it matches perfectly. So it, over time, things always melt down to a three quarters, one quarter distribution and that distribution is called the steady state. Okay, any questions or comments about that idea? Yeah. Are there um, times when stochastic matrices aren't diagonalized for? Uh, that is a fantastic question. Oh, that's a great question. Well, let's think, can we just make, can we make, so, so the way you make a non-diagonalizable matrix, you put it in Jordan form. And then the rows have to sum to one. I think you can't because the rows have to sum to one. So whatever you have on the diagonal, if you have something on the upper diagonal, then that row will sum to more than the row below it. Um, but this is a great question. I don't know. I'll, I'll, give, I'll give some bonus points if anyone can dig this up and put it on campus for it. That's a great question. Uh, yeah, so actually there's a whole theory of, uh, this is kind of the next thing that I wanted to um, just mention and, and throw out there. There's a whole theory of things, facts about uh, of facts about stochastic matrices that imply these things. And the big, the big theorem to look up is there's a theorem called the Perron-Frobenius theorem. Frobenius theorem. Um, so you can look it up and it tells you all sorts of very specific things. So if you have a matrix whose entries are between zero and one and whose rows sum up to one, there's a lot you can say about that matrix. And one thing in particular is one fun fact is that one is always an eigenvalue. Is always an eigenvalue. Why is one always an eigenvalue? Um, there is a really easy way. This one, I won't do a lot of like theory like proofs here, but I will show you why one is always an eigenvalue. So let's let M be a stochastic matrix. That's a matrix where the rows sum to one. Rows sum to one. Why is one always an eigenvector? Well, you can do the following calculation. You can take the matrix M and you can multiply it by the column vector one, 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 dot, 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 one. So if you multiply M by the column vector one, 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 what do you get? Does anyone know? This is like a jokey, jokey question because you don't actually have to think very hard. You don't have to know what M is. You just, there's one fact you know about M, which is that the rows sum to one. Yeah. So just get M. You get M? Well, you should get a column vector, right? So this is like N by N, and this is an N by one. So you should get, so you get something about M. All right, let's let everybody think for one minute. Feel free to talk to your neighbors. Tell me what is M times one, 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 one gonna be? Uh, all right.
if you want, you could do an example. We had it, right? We could do two fifths, three fifths, times one fifth, four fifths, times one one, what comes out, right? That's a good way to maybe see the pattern. People are being very quiet, so I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna stop the timer early. Who wants to tell me what is m times one 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 one? Yeah. Is it one 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 one? It's one 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 one. Yes. When you multiply a matrix by one 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 one, what you are doing is you are summing the entries in the row. So any matrix times one 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 will be a vector where it'll have the sum of row one, the sum of row two, the sum of row three, and so on. This is a matrix where all the rows are given to sum to one. So what do you get is 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. And that means that 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 is an eigenvector. And actually, it's a right eigenvector. So 1, 1, 1 is always a right eigenvector. What is the left eigenvector of eigenvalue 1? That is the interesting thing. That's the like, steady state probability that we often converge to. Um, and there always is 1 because 1 is an eigenvalue. And the two lambdas are the same. That's exciting. OK. Um, but. Uh, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 is not the steady state distribution because it's on the right. If it was on the left, then we would be in business. So 1 is always an eigenvalue. Um, that's a fact. Uh, you can get more than one steady state. So the 1 being an eigenvalue, it could be that the eigenspace that goes with 1 is more than one dimensional. If it's only one dimensional, then there's only one eigenvector of eigenvalue 1, and then you definitely converge to that, like we saw over here. right? So there was just the, this one eigenvector that went with the eigenvalue 1. But there could be, in principle, there could be more than one eigenvector. And then like, which one do you converge to? Right? If there's one eigenvector of eigenvalue 1, there's another eigenvector of eigenvalue 1, which one is the steady state distribution? And the way we deal with this is we have a notion of irreducible. So uh, a Markov chain is called irreducible. When it's irreducible, it has only one eigenvector of eigenvalue 1. So a Markov chain. is called irreducible. Irreducible. Um, irreducible means every state can get to every other state. Means every state can get to every state. And so I'll, I'll draw you a little picture to see what this means. So this is like a definition of the word irreducible. Um, Markov chains you can think about as little graphs, and you can think about like moving around the graph. So as an example, in our rainy, sunny thing, you could think about that. You could draw this picture, rainy or a sunny, and you could draw arrows. Rainy to sunny is, I guess rainy to rainy was two-fifths. Rainy to sunny was three-fifths. Um, sunny to sunny was four-fifths, four-fifths, and sunny to rainy was one-fifth. So this is our matrix. M was 2, 3, 1, 4. You can think about that matrix as connecting these graphs, these dots, R and S, these vertices, R and S, with edges that have weight 2 fifths, 1 fifths, 3 fifths. And if you think about it like that, you can kind of imagine that what is a Markov chain is just like some traversal of this graph and the list of vertices you hit where every time you move according to these probabilities. And if you look at it as a graph, you can clearly make sense of what does it mean for every state to be able to get to every state. So can you walk, starting at R, can you find your way to S? And in this one, you can go from R to S, you can go from S to R, it's no problem. Yeah? So are all Markov chains also finite state machines? Uh, or like with weighted I would say I would say they are all weighted graphs where the vertices, yeah, let's write this down. Uh, let's say there are weighted, so a Markov chain is equivalent to, this is a great, a great thing to write down is equivalent to, what is it? It's a, a graph. What is a graph? A graph is, has a set of vertices and a set of edges. The vertices are the states, set of states. And the edges, the edges are, uh, uh, I guess they're directed edges. We write E arrow for directed edges. Uh, so there's an edge 
uh, from s to s prime of weight probability to go from s to s prime. Okay, so it's a directed graph with these, this exact setup. And that means, for example, that like the total weight of all the edges out of one state must sum to, to one, right? So three fifths plus two fifths is one because th those are the total weight of all the edges. Um, I believe a finite state machine is like a directed graph that also has some extra rules. So uh, let's just say it's this. And I, I don't know if this is exactly the same as a finite state machine or like which one is a subset of which one. Um, but this is what it is. Yeah, fantastic question. Um, so if you like graphs, you can think about it this way. Uh, okay. And so what does irreducible mean? Um, irreducible means there is a path of non-zero weights to get from any state to any other state. So this one is very clearly irreducible. You can go from R to S. You can go from S to R. Every vertex can visit every other vertex. What would be an example of a non-irreducible Markov chain? What? Well, this sounds very silly, but you could have rainy and sunny. And then over here, you could have uh, winter and more winter. And maybe there's no way to go from winter, right? Maybe there's no way. So we'll draw this, uh, this one like we had before. This is supposed to be a copy of what we had before. Okay, and then over here is the winter one, and that one is just winter forever. You either get winter or more winter, and it goes back and forth. This, all together, this would be some weather model with r four states, rainy, sunny, winter, and more winter. So it has four states, uh, but it's actually not irreducible. It's actually kind of like two separate markup chains. There's no way for it to go from being winter to rainy, right? It's just always winter or more winter. Like, you never, this is like in Game of Thrones after the, after the White Walkers come and kill you, okay? So you just stay in this state forever, you can never get to this, it's not even possible. This would be an example of a reducible Markov chain, and it's really, it's called reducible because it's kind of like, you can think of it as reducing down to two actual Markov chains. So an irreducible Markov chain, every state can get to every other state, it's like you have one picture like this. Yeah? Uh, then what are snakes, what are, would our snakes and ladders example be irreducible because we had two states, eight and four, yeah. that were unreachable? Uh, that is a great question. Yeah, that because of those states, it's not irreducible. There's actually one other state on it that is also making the whole thing irreducible. And there's a, there's a special state in that snakes and ladders game where if you go there, you can never go anywhere else again. And that was the final state. So because you get stuck in nine and you just stay nine, nine, nine forever, um, that would be one that is not irreducible. Okay, yeah, so this is a good, 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 good comment to make. Uh, yeah, so, so re re irreducible kind of means you can go from anywhere to anywhere. There's no like places that you can't get to or places you get stuck or anything like that. And if it's irreducible, then it definitely only has one eigenvector of eigenvalue one. So if it's irreducible, if it's irreducible, <coughs> then it only has one eigenvector. Okay, like technically you can multiply by scalars to get more eigenvectors. I mean this, the dimension of the eigenspace is one. Uh, but let's write down has one eigenvector like like people who aren't too technical. Okay, one, one eigenvector of eigenvalue eigenvalue lambda equals one and that eigenvector will satisfy p equals p times m and and this is the cool part. When that happens, you're going to have the following situation for any, for any starting probability and for any P zero, uh, we'll have the limit as N goes to infinity of P zero to the power M. So if you start with anything and you apply the matrix to the power N over and over again, and you take the limit as N goes to infinity, that will converge to these steady state probabilities that's going to equal p. Um, and I'm going to call it, let's call it p infinity for this reason. It's the thing that happens at time infinity, p infinity. Okay. Uh, so that's the situation. When you have this situation, um, things will converge to the steady state probability distribution vector. Oh, uh, I think everything I've said so far is true if you have a finite set of states. Let me, let me say, let me make sure to clarify. Uh, if states are finite, so like, you can't have infinitely many states, then everything I've said so far is true. If things are infinite, you need one other 
caveat, which is uh, there's a notion of transient, um, which will be useful to us anyway, so let's, let's see what it is. Transient versus recurrent, recurrent state states. So transient means uh, the state is only visited finitely many times and then never visited again. So transient, so this is more a definition, transient state. A transient state is a state that in one trajectory of the Markov chain is visited some number of times and then after that is never visited again. So uh, the state is visited a finite number of times. A times then never again and this happens with probability 100% so this is the definition of a transient state uh, and the, in contrast a recurrent state is visited an infinite number of times always visited an infinite number of times with probability 100%. Okay, and I can give you two nice examples that I think will make this very clear what these are. In our stakes and ladders games, all of the states except for that last state, number nine, those were all transient states. And that was because when you play the game of stakes and ladders with probability 100%, you will eventually win. So it might take you, maybe you're really unlucky and it takes you 100 rolls or something. But with probability 100%, you will eventually reach the end, and at the moment you reach the end, you have visited, you have finished visiting states zero to eight. All of those states will never be visited again. They were visited some number of times. That number is a finite number. Those are all transient states. So zero to eight were all transient states. State number nine is a recurrent state because when you do the trajectory on that stakes and ladders game we set up, when you get to number nine, you just stay there forever and ever. So past the point of where you are done, you will just be in state nine forever. You will have visited it an infinite number of times. Um, in our rainy day, sunny day thing, both rainy and sunny were also recurrent states. And that's because you go back and forth between rainy and sunny forever, the chance that you will stay sunny, sunny, sunny for the rest of eternity is zero. Um, you will always have another rainy somewhere in, in the infinite list. So that's recurrent and transient. And uh, this condition that the states have to be finite for this convergence um, in an infinite Markov chain is replaced with the states have to be recurrent. So if the states are recurrent, then this will still work. Uh, okay, so this is some general stuff about Markov chains. I think the convergence is really cool. I think thinking about it in terms of eigenvectors and eigenvalues was a good way. I think this is actually the coolest application of linear algebra. Like, I don't know why they don't teach this in linear algebra class. They, this is how they should start. Yeah, question here. Uh, it will approach be infinity, but isn't that like assuming the other eigenvalues less than one? Yeah, so this is the, 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 the part of the peron frobenius theorem is that all the other eigenvalues will be less than one. So it, I think that is a true statement. And then let me, yeah, I, I think I'm pretty sure you guys should go read uh, in, in a technical book. So I won't, I won't write it down in case I'm technically wrong. But I'm pretty sure the other part of the peron frobenius theorem is there's this one eigenvector of eigenvalue one, and the rest of the eigenvalues are between zero and one strictly. And so they all go down to zero. Um, as, as n goes to infinity. That's exactly right. Uh, okay, there's one other cool fact. When you have this setup, there is a nice formula that is a cool fact, which is that p infinity is equal to 1 over the expected number of something. So you could find p infinity. Um, this is a, a, a fact that sometimes works. Uh, it works if everything is recurrent. Okay, so if all the states are recurrent, then that means every state is visited infinitely many times. And when, when things are visited infinitely many times, it makes sense to ask, how long until the next visit, right? Because it's going to happen eventually. If it's recurrent, eventually it's going to come back to where we are. And you can ask, how long until it's visited? So I'm going to make this random variable ns, which is how many times, how many steps, how many time steps until s is visited again. Again. Um, and there's a fact that the p infinity is the expected number of 1 over the expected number of steps until s is visited again when you start at s, given s is 0 equals 
lowercase s. And so, for example, in our rainy sunny example, rainy sunny, uh, I guess I, I made it rainy nice, rainy nice example. So because we know it's, we, we calculated p infinity th through some other means, right? We knew it was 25%, 75%. And therefore, we can invert this formula to get this, that if it's a rainy day, the time until the next rainy day is on average four days. And so in the rainy sunny example, the average time, uh, I think you could even say between. I think that, that makes sense. Between rainy days, rainy days is four days. And four was equal to one divided by 25%. That's how we got it. So if, if today is a rainy day, the number of days until the next rainy day is on average four. And similarly, the average time between nice days is something you can calculate. It turns out it's four thirds, four thirds days. So if today is a nice day, then the next nice day will be 1.333 days from now, on average. Uh, which is probably cause, it's probably because tomorrow will probably be another nice day. So a lot of the time, it's one day. And sometimes it's more than one day. That's why the average is 4 thirds. So that's a nice thing you can calculate. OK. Any questions or comments <coughs> about this one? OK, so we're going to go back. Now that we have these no notations of transient and recurrent, and this idea of what you converge to. We're going to try to apply this, not in the rainy sunny example, but in the snakes and ladders example. So in the last couple of minutes, uh, what we're going to do, the snakes and ladders example again. OK? And so one thing I was going to say is, what is the p infinity for snakes and ladders? You know, let's, let's, let's do it. I think we, we sort of talked about this and spoiled this. But what is the p infinity for the snakes and ladders example? Um, and I'll give you one minute to, to think about it. OK, there's only like 10 seconds left. Uh, if you haven't figured it out yet, just put it in a guess. I think once you see it, you'll go, oh, OK, that was, that was obvious, actually. Uh, so this is a bit of a, a silly one. OK. Where's the mouse? Here's the mouse. OK. OK, so let's see what people said. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. And actually, I made all the blanks that like, connected to each other. So whatever you type into 1 had to be the same problem. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and then a 1. Uh, the last one is 1. So it can't be 9, because then the sum wouldn't be 1. right? So it's a probability vector. It has to sum to 1. If you typed in 9, you're probably mistaking the probabilities with the indices. Um, so it's in index co corresponding to state number 9, um, but the probability is 1. So in the snakes and ladders. So, so here's another example. In snakes plus ladders. P infinity is equal to 0, 0, 0, all the way up to the last state is a 1. And you can see that actually this is the last row. So you can also check that P infinity uh, is in fact equal to P infinity times M, because the last row of the snakes and ladders thing is also 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. Um, that's saying that if you start in state 9, you end in state 9. And what's happening in snakes and ladders is that all the first eight sta states are transient. And the last state is the only recurrent state that you get stuck in forever and ever. And the nice thing about transient states is, based on all this like theory that we kind of have, is that in the transient states, you can make sense of what is the number of times you visit it. So in 
So four transient states. Okay, and we're sure that all these states are transient states. You can ask, you can ask, how many times on average do you visit? Or how many times do you visit? So how many times you visit is going to be some random number. It could be very large, like it could be unboundedly large, but with 100% chance, it will be finite. And you can ask what that is, and you can write down expressions for that, and you will be sure that whatever expression you write down will converge and like will make be a meaningful thing. Of course, for the last state, the number of times you visit it is going to be infinite. So if you write down some expression for what is the number of times you visit the last state, it's going to work out to infinity. But if you write down how many times you visit these first eight states, it's going to be some finite number. And you can write that down. And in fact, that is what I want you to do in the next mathematized question, which I believe is probably the last one we'll do. So find an expression for the total number of visits to some square. So s could be squares 0, square 1, square 2. Write down an expression that is the number of times that the square is visited. And the tools you have, the things you can put together, are probability vectors and the transition matrix. Those are the things you can do. And you can do powers of the transition matrix. You can combine them however you think um, it will work. And see if you can write down something that will tell you the expected number of this. OK, so ns is a random number. But the expected value of ns is something involving probabilities. And that's something we can figure out. So I'll give you like two or three minutes to work on that. We'll see what people have at the end. And if you know how to do this one, the next thing we're going to answer is how many rolls till you get to the end. How many rolls till you get to the end is very closely connected to this. Um, there's a very obvious connection. You can probably figure out what it is. Uh, so, okay, go work on that. Take like a couple minutes, talk to your neighbors, see if you can figure it out, and we'll see how many people got it uh, by the end of class. Oh, and I will say, this is something that has come up. I know this building is like very far away from things and like really out of the way. So if you have a class that you need to run to, just like go, like don't feel bad. Uh, it's totally okay if you have to go early or if I end up going a little over, don't feel like you need to wait for me. Just, just do what you need to do. Okay. So yeah, like now would be a great time. If you need to leave, just leave. Otherwise, stay and do this. Uh, okay, see you guys in a, a couple of minutes when we take this up. Yeah, I think that expression, that, that expression is right. Yeah, it's like this, right? S state S. Um, Without 
Okay, so there's like 30 seconds left. I'm gonna stop the timer when it ends. So if you don't know the answer, just put an I don't have an expression. That'll help me know how quickly to go over it. Uh, probably I'll just tell you the expression next class because we are very close to the end. But just tell me if you know the expression or not so I can get a sense of how you guys are following along. Okay. All right, let's take a look. Okay, 16 people don't know, five people know. We're gonna do it, we'll do it nice and slow in next class, uh, so we're not behind the, the time, uh, and we'll figure it out. Uh, think about it until next class. If you want a hint, go watch that YouTube video with the snakes and ladders. So that, that whole video is only like 20 minutes long and they do a lot of stuff, um, but there will be a nice hint that will maybe jog your memory and you can try to figure it out, uh, and then we're gonna do it on Tuesday. Okay. Uh, see you guys on Tuesday and have a great weekend. Yeah. Yeah.